Glory to Jesus Christ. Let's pray our prayer of the Holy Spirit. Today is Wednesday, February 3rd, the Feast of Saints Blaise and Ansgar. And St. Blaise, the tradition is to have your throat blessed on this day. And uh, so we're doing special prayers for the pandemic at this time. St. Blaise was uh, martyred about the year 316, a bishop of Sebaste in Armenia. And uh, he was martyred under Licinius. And St. Ansgar was born in France, lived from the year 801 to 865, became known as the Apostle of the North. His great evangelical work in Denmark and Sweden. He was the first Archbishop of Hamburg and then of Bremen. And Pope Gregory IV appointed him as his delegate to Denmark and Sweden. In reply to those who questioned some miracles attributed to him, he said, Were God to choose me to do such things, I would ask him for one miracle only, that by his power he would make me a good man. O oh God, who sent the bishops Blaise and Ansgar with the message of the gospel, grant that we, like them, may always walk in the light of your truth. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're on page 33, Blessed are the Poor in Spirit and the Eight Doors of the Kingdom by Father Jacques Philippe, published by Scepter Press. One of the fundamental ideas of Scripture is that in the Messianic age, the poor will be honored. It will be a reversal of situations. Those who are humbled or excluded will be of the highest place. Here is an example from Isaiah. On that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. And this is how 71 describes it. That was Isaiah 29, 18 through 19. And this is Psalm 71, verses 4, 12 through 13. This is how Psalm 71 describes the ideal king of whom Israel dreams. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people and give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. For he delivers the needy when he calls, and the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy. He saves the lives of the needy. Mary sings of this reversal in the Messianic age in her Magnificat. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. Luke 1, 52. Page 34, the test of time. But God's intervention on behalf of the poor isn't always immediate, and this can cause difficulties. The promises of the Beatitudes sometimes seem contradicted by reality. So many poor people seem to be forgotten. So many weep and are not consoled. So many are hungry or thirsty for justice and not satisfied. Yet God is faithful. All his promises will be fulfilled. Not an iota of the law will be forgotten, as Jesus affirms. Sometimes there are mysterious delays before God's intervention on behalf of the poor. 
God's apparent silence tests endurance. The cry repeated in several psalms is, How long? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Psalm 13, verses 1 through 3. But notice that this sorrowful questioning concludes with an act of hope. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. We find similar passages elsewhere. That was Psalm 13, verses 5 through 6. In Psalm 42, uh, verses 9 and 11, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Why are you downcast on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will again praise him, my help and my God. God's response is certain, but it can't be foreseen or programmed. Patience and sorrow have their place. <clears throat> but in the end, even they are positive and that they perform a hidden work. Create a desire, prepare an interior space for embracing the compensatory reward when it finally comes. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Lamentations. 326. God's response will be so much more beautiful and rich when the wait has been long and trying. Among other things, interior poverty leads to consent to the experience of not being masters of our time, unable to manipulate God or oblige him to enter into our expectations or plans. His intervention remains free and sovereign, unforeseen. Having mastery of a time frame carries with it enormous human security and makes waiting easier. But there is no time frame into which God can be forced. You know neither the day nor the hour, Jesus says. Matthew 25, 13. The poverty of not being masters of our own time is hard to bear. But it calls us to a pure hope, one without human support. Little by little, it engenders patience, humility, meekness, creating the desire that one day will bring fulfillment beyond all expectation. Poverty as a trial and a grace, the experience of the desert. One of the most es essential Old Testament texts for understanding the meaning of spiritual poverty is chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. It contains a fragment of a long discourse by Moses to the people, a magnificent synthesis of what we might call the experience of the desert. For Israel, the 40 years of wandering after leaving Egypt and before entering the Promised Land were a foundational experience, but they symbolize a reality that is part of any spiritual journey. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you through these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. And that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out upon you, and your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 through 5. The Lord wished to have Israel, like each of us, pass through a paradoxical experience, a sorrowful path of poverty, of humiliation, that was at the same time a wonderful experience of faithfulness to his providence. God nourished his people with manna. Their clothes were not worn out. Their feet were not swollen. 
The experience of poverty is meant to help us realize that we truly have in our hearts to know ourselves as we are without illusions. This is meant also to awaken a new hunger in our hearts, hunger for God. In poverty, at the hour of the struggle, we realize that no food, no satisfaction, no human security can suffice. We must direct our heart toward God. When we do that, the Lord reveals himself and gives us an entirely new, previously unknown food, manna. The food that comes from the very mouth of God, the words of truth and of love he addresses to his children, the breath from the divine mouth that discreetly sustains us. This trial is a time of humiliation, but also of grace, for it makes us open up to new nourishment, new resources to which we were not accustomed before, a nourishment that is not physical, much more subtle, but the only one that can make us stronger. No longer Egypt's cauldrons of meat and its bread, but a delicious dew, not to be kept for tomorrow, but given each day by the Lord, in just the amount that one needs. Neither more nor less. See chapter 16 of Exodus. Here is the nourishment that makes it possible for the people to make the long journey to the promised land. God gives himself as food to the poor person who comes and counts on him. This beautiful mystery reaches its supreme fulfillment in the Eucharist. And to fully appreciate the Eucharist and to receive its riches, one needs a poor heart. The Hebrew Bible uses several terms to express the idea of poverty. The most important is anav, anawim in the plural. Depending on the context, it means poor or humble or meek. And all three of these can be found in our modern Bibles as well as in the ancient Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible. And it is a matter of profound significance that these terms are also found in the Beatitudes and other New Testament passages. The book of Numbers uses the word anav in an interesting passage about Moses. After the Exodus, he was accompanied by his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam, but their relationship was strained because of a marriage of which Aaron and Miriam did not approve. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all the men that were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tent and called, Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted with all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in dark speech. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud removed from the tent. And behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us, because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, Heal her, O God, I beseech thee. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, she would not be shamed seven days. Let her be shut up outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days. We don't know why Moses' brother and sister objected to his marriage. But this episode is an occasion for the venting of a different grievance, deeper and no doubt latent for a long time. 
namely a certain jealousy towards Moses. But why speak only of these people? Is not the Lord speaking also to us? Moses' weakness and humility, faced with this criticism and bitterness, are described in a, be a, a beautiful way. A man more meek than all the men that were on the face of the earth, or it might be rendered more humble. He is not angry or defensive and remains silent. Then God himself intervenes to defend his servant and punish Miriam by making her a leper. Yes, Moses prays that his sister may be healed. God, who can refuse nothing to his servant, does so. While keeping her outside the camp for seven days, we have time to reflect a bit on her conduct. God's words show how unique was the relationship between him and Moses, a bond closer than that with any other prophet. God entrusted his people to Moses, spoke with him face to face, for Moses was so humble, so poor of heart, that God entered into intimacy with him and confided so many things to him. Page 42. How do we become the most humble on earth? The characterization of Moses as the humblest man on earth is a prefiguration of Christ. It has two sources. There is a humility that comes from suffering, from trials in which we experience our limits, our weakness, and become progressively humble. This is absolutely necessary. As Bernadette of Lourdes said, many humiliations are necessary to create a little humility. We should be deeply grateful to the Lord for the situations we experience that impoverish us, humiliate us, make us realize our weakness and our misery. Therese of Lisieux said, the Almighty has done great things in the soul of his divine mother's child. And the greatest thing is to have her sh have shown her her littleness or impatience. One part of Moses' humility had this source. But there is another source of humility, far deeper and radical, the experience of God. Moses was so humble, more than all the others, because his experience of God was so much deeper. Did he not spend 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai speaking with God in the clouds? It might be said that there is a lower form of poverty and a higher form of poverty. One comes from human experience, the other from the austerity much more radical, that the Holy Spirit worked within us. Happy is the soul that possesses the divine blessing, that is poor in spirit by the Spirit of God, which grace has made poor, and not the trials and coercion of life's misfortunes, declared Catherine de Bat, 17th century founder of a religious community. Catherine Mechthild de Bat. To adore and to cling to. Adore et adhere. This is what the saints experience in those spiritual nights they sometimes go through. Without using this language, which is often poorly understood, we can simply say that an encounter with God, especially in authentic prayer, necessarily involves sorrowful elements. Similarly, there is no way to have real interior poverty without great faithfulness to prayer, the truth-bearing activity in which human beings stand radically poor and naked before God, Teresa of Avila says in the interior castle. It is contemplating his greatness that we discover our lowliness. In seeing his purity, that we see our dirtiness. In considering his humility, that we see how far we are from being humble. The first step in acquiring humility is to recognize that we have none. <clears throat> the deeper our encounter with God, the more humble we become. Humility is a sign of real experience of God. Such an encounter with the living God destroys all pride. And knowing God in his power and majesty, we understand that we are nothing compared to him. Our limits are related, are revealed. Our sins and radical poverty disclosed. 
the implacable purity of the divine light, like a ray of sunshine piercing a dark room and showing the tiniest specks of dust, gives the soul evidence of its misery and absolute incapacity. See this related passage from Teresa of Avila. When the prayer comes from God's spirit, there is no need to go dredging up things in order to derive some humility and shame because the Lord himself gives this prayer in a manner very different from that which we gain through our nice little reasonings. For such humility is nothing in comparison with the true humility the Lord with his light ear reteaches and which causes an embarrassment that undoes me. It is well known that God gives a knowledge that makes us realize that we have no good of ourselves. And the greater the favors, the greater this knowledge. Teresa Manavala in her Book of Her Life, translated by Karen Kavanaugh, 2008, page 94. We see this clearly in Scripture. Job, after God spoke to him, is aware that he must be silent. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah, after having seen God in the sanctuary, borne upon clouds and surrounded by seraphim, whose voices proclaim the divine holiness and make the gateposts shake, exclaims, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, 5. Peter, after the miraculous catch of fish, throws himself at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 5, 8. Human beings discover the extraordinary humility of God insofar as they deepen their encounter with God, who humble himself to experience human weakness. See Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Only God is truly humble. Only God is capable of humbling himself, as we see in the mystery of Christ. From what height would humankind lower itself? There is no real humility except by participating in divine humility, which is revealed to us so perfectly in Christ, especially in his obedience and humiliation on the cross. True humility is not a human invention. We are all capable of false modesty. We must, as St. Paul says, put on the humility of Christ. The same can be said for meekness one of humility's most beautiful fruits, as opposed to hardness, a fruit of pride. Only God is meek, and all true meekness is a participation in divine weakness. The source of all humility and all meekness is the heart of Christ, as Christ's words in Matthew's Gospel attest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Matthew eleven twenty nine. We must, as St. Paul says, put on the humility of Christ. See Philippians 2, 4 to 6. An experience of God, and therefore of faith, contains an intrinsic note of humility. Faith presupposes receptiveness, docility, and obedience, which only a humble person is capable of. True faith has no arrogance, as Pope Francis says in the encyclical Lumen Fidei. A person with authentic Christian faith is always acutely aware that this is a free gift, not something of which he can be proud of. In the truth of love, it is not one that can be imposed by force. It is not a truth that stifles the individual. Since it is born of love, it can penetrate to the heart, to the personal core of each man and woman. Clearly, then, 
faith is not intransient, but grows in respectful coexistence with others. One who believes may not be presumptuous. On the contrary, truth leads to humility, since believers know that rather than ourselves possessing truth, it is truth that embraces and possesses us. Far from making us inflexible, the security of faith sets us on a journey. It enables witness and dialogue with all. From Pope Francis's encyclical, Lumen Fidei, 34, 1913, uh, no, 2013. Genuine love also is humble. Someone deeply in love, especially when the love is reciprocated, always has the feeling that this love is a kind of grace, a gift, not a personal achievement to glory in. Humility is essential because it is both side and condition of all authentic love. To love is to leave behind any pretension of self-sufficiency. All arrogance, all domination, all possessiveness, all superiority. While making oneself small before the other and embracing the other in his or her poverty and weakness. No love is true and durable except that between two poor hearts. The rich are forever in competition. Only the poor of heart know how to love and embrace each other reciprocally. God made himself poor because he is love. Page 48. The poor who remain in Israel. Returning to our exploration of the meaning of spiritual poverty in the Old Testament and of the word anau, anav, which specifically describes it, let us now take a look at another passage a very different one, in which the mystery of poverty is central. It is from Zephaniah, a prophet of the 7th century before Christ. As in many of the prophetic books, Zephaniah begins with an invitation to conversation, then looks at the future, announcing God's intervention, and concludes with magnificent promises of Jerusalem's restoration that that will be only after a period of sorrowful humiliations and purifications, such as Isaiah speaks of when writing about the Israelites who remain faithful. The conversation to which the prophet invites us is essentially the elimination of all pride. Uh, Zephaniah 2.3 Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his commands. Seek righteousness, Seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the wrath of the Lord. Later, in a very important passage, Zephaniah uses the people of the future, the renewed Israel, as a people of poverty. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in the holy mountain. For I leave in the midst of your people humbled and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no wrong and utter no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall pasture and lie down and none shall make them afraid. Israel will be healed of its sin and its offenses against God, freed from all shame, and this healing will be essentially a purification from all pride, from all human pretension. Here is one of the fundamental themes of Isaiah's prediction. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away. Isaiah 2, 12 through 18. This purification will be radical, 
and God will let only meek and lowly people remain in Israel. Ani and thou, poor and weak, or without importance. The fruits of this purification will be very positive. Those who are left will find refuge in the name of the Lord. God will be their power and their refuge, their unshakable security. This little people will be rooted in truth. No more lies, no more deceit. All will be completely truthful with God, with themselves and with others. They will graze. God himself will give them the nourishment they need. Finally, they will lie down and none shall make them afraid. They will be at peace, resting in God. They will have no more fear or worry. The prophet is thus announcing that a time of radical poverty will come, but one with very positive benefits, holiness, truth, freedom, security, peace, interior power, the poor will find all they need in God. This text describes God's pedagogy toward Israel, his education process. God permits trials, sorrowful humiliations, and severe losses to form those who are left. And from this just people, the Messiah will be born. We encounter this just people at the beginning of the New Testament, personified in Mary. <gasps> Excuse me. God bless you too. The rest of Zephaniah's text, the magnificent promise of salvation, is used often by the liturgy in speaking about the Virgin. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cast out your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear evil no more. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on the day of festival. This does not apply only to Israel, but to the church in general. We are not better than our fathers. Obviously, not all the tribulations in the church's history are found here. There are certainly periods of humiliation and sorrowful purification in the history of ecclesiastical communities that make them poor and humble, mirroring the Beatitudes. Trials are a necessary part of the experience of every community in person. Zephaniah's text also expresses God's pedagogy, his education process, toward each believer. The destruction of all pride, all arrogance, all pretensions, and human illusions is part, though not the whole, of every spiritual itinerary. No human being might boast in the presence of God, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.29. The words of the prophet can be taken as God's words addressed personally to each of us. I will eradicate from you all pride and you will cease being proud, permitting you only a humble and poor heart. And only then will you find your refuge in God, your truth, your nourishment, your power, and your peace. Spiritual poverty must touch all aspects of our lives. It is helpful to see how this is expressed in our fundamental relationship with God, with self, and with others. And finally, with the word world in general. Being poor in spirit and all these relationships is a source of freedom and of joy. We'll let off 
there on page 53. Poverty in the relationship with God. And we can pray our prayer that the Lord taught us, the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's see who's waving. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Joe O'Brien, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Philip O'Driscoll, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Have a blessed day.